I don't like RPGs. I wish I did. I feel like I'm missing out on a lot, but I just can't get into the genre. With the one major exception being Paper Mario. I first played this series when I was a kid with The Thousand Year Door on the GameCube, the second game in the series, and while I love a lot of things about it, the art style, writing, setting, and plenty more, I didn't like the combat. That eventually changed and I really started to dig into the original over 10 years later. So yeah, this wasn't a series I really enjoyed until my senior year of high school when I was 17, which at this point was only about three years ago, when I finally gave the original game an actual shot. And I enjoyed the game so much, I immediately rebought the sequel and loved that one even more. Before I start this review, I should say uh, this is only my second playthrough, so don't expect the greatest gameplay out of me, and I'm also recording this off the Wii's virtual console. I do have an N64, I just don't have a copy of the original Paper Mario, and I try to avoid emulation in this channel, but if it's official emulation, I'll deal with it. Hey, at least uh, we're getting higher video quality out of this, I guess. Also, like I said, I don't play too many RPGs, so don't expect the most objective outlook in this game. I usually review platformers in this channel because that's a genre I know super well, so I feel like I can give a really... I don't know, as close to an objective review as I, as possible, but for an RPG, not so much. Uh, this, so because of that, this is going to be the most subjective video I have ever made. Also, it might be full of really dumb statements because I don't know this genre very well, so I may say, say some things that are either just stupid or obvious, something that's not even worth bringing up. So uh, I guess I apologize in advance for that. Oh, and uh, yes, I do see the irony in my username being BrendanBlair64 and it taking 11 videos to get to the Nintendo 64. I want to go by my actual name, but Brendan Blair was already taken, so me being a stupid Nintendo fan attached that number at the end. That is my origin. Paper Mario was created partially because the N64 had basically no RPGs. After everything was said and done, it had two. This game and Quest 64. This happened because the developer that made the SNES the RPG machine that it was, Square, left Nintendo for PlayStation because you can fit way more in a CD than an N64 card. Nintendo's answer to this was to hire the developer Intelligent Systems to make a new Mario RPG. Nowadays, they're mostly known for that one franchise that has a little too many spots in Smash. Okay, they're always known as that in Japan, but the series didn't become all that big here in the US until a few years ago. But for a while, in the US, the first two Paper Marios were the most defining games. Paper Mario started development as a sequel to the previous Mario RPG being... Super Mario RPG, simply titled Super Mario RPG 2. But due to some licensing issues with Square and the name, they had to change it to Mario Story in Japan and Paper Mario Everywhere Else, which I believe those two names are much better. Considering this game looks and plays nothing like Super Mario RPG, and the final names fit the storybook aesthetic, this game has much better. Finally, in 2001, being one of the final Nintendo 64 games, it was released. Being a Mario RPG, this game's story is simple, but there's definitely a lot more going on compared to the main Mario games. The game opens up with a storybook telling the tales of the Star Spirits. The Star Spirits are seven magical star creatures that grant the selfless wishes of the citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom with the help of their combined magic, but mostly the Star Rod. Totally not from Kirby. Then suddenly, Bowser and his main minion, Cammy, literally tape themselves into the storybook to steal the Star Rod so Bowser can finally grant his selfish wishes that the Star Spirits refuse to grant themselves. Later, Mario and Luigi are invited to Peach's castle for a party, and after some socializing, Mario finally goes to talk to Peach. Then suddenly, the castle starts shaking and rising up to the sky, and eventually in space, because Bowser somehow built a castle under Peach's that can fly and no one noticed. How? Mario instinctively starts defending Peach from Bowser, but unfortunately Bowser, with the power of the Star Rod, makes himself invincible and knocks Mario out of the window from space. He lands in a forest and I think Mario is supposed to be dead at this point. At least they imply that he ran out of HP and I mean, how do you survive a fall like that? It doesn't matter because the spirits of the Star Spirits... Star Spirit Spirits? ...are able to revive Mario, and he soon wakes up from a dream where his Star Spirits tell him to go to Shooting Star Summit, the closest place on Earth to Star Haven, the place where all the Star Spirits live. When Mario goes there, they all reveal that Bowser has ordered his minions to hold them all captive in different areas in Mushroom Kingdom, so they're not really there, they're just projecting themselves to tell Mario this stuff. 
So now it's Mario's job to save not just Peach, but also her castle, all those weren't able to get out in time, the Star Spirits, and take the Star Rod back from Bowser. I like this plot a lot, it's pretty simple for an RPG because it's Mario, but it's not too simple either, there's far more going on than just Peach gets kidnapped by Bowser. I like this approach a lot because for such a different feeling Mario game, it makes sense to have some things feel the same, but also build around what we're already familiar with. I mean, it'd be pretty lame if there wasn't much else in the story besides Bowser kidnaps Peach. The gameplay, unlike almost every game I've ever reviewed, is not a platformer, but a turn-based RPG, meaning there's a lot of areas to explore, puzzles to solve, experience to earn, and bosses to fight. It being a turn-based RPG, the combat isn't as simple as just jumping on ahead of a Goomba. Instead, you're gonna have to take turns attacking the enemy. The game really eases you into the system, and I feel like it might ease you in a little too much because the first 20 or so minutes of this game, the combat is just pressing a well, keeping an eye on your health. Or heart points as this game calls it, or HP for short. It thankfully doesn't take too long for it to start introducing new mechanics. At first you can only jump on enemies, but then you get the hammer pretty quickly. At first it's not clear why you would use a hammer over the jump or vice versa because they do the same amount of damage, but then the game throws spiked and flying enemies at you. You can't jump on spikes and you can't swing your hammer on an enemy that's too high up, so you have to use whatever attack won't get you killed. The game continues to slowly introduce more and more elements to add more strategy to the game. Like, it quickly explains how encounters work. Like, you see all the enemies on the overworld and you can first strike them, which does more damage to the enemy before the battle even begins. But enemies can do the same to you, which makes certain enemies like Koopas terrifying. And it's not long until you learn action commands. It's this mechanic that either makes your attacks more potent or allows you to dodge. You dodge by pressing the A button at the right time. But dodging doesn't make it so that you don't take any damage unless it's a weak attack, but it does save you 1 HP each time you do it, which doesn't sound like much, but it really builds up after just a few turns. With some enemies like fuzzies, it's incredibly hard to tell when you're supposed to dodge, others are way more obvious. The action command you need to do to make your attack stronger varies from attack to attack. Sometimes it's just pressing A at the right time, others you have you mashing buttons as fast as you can, or maybe a good old quick time event. There's a lot of different action commands throughout the whole game, and they get more and more interesting as the game goes on. A lot of these attacks are called special attacks and will require FP, or flower points, to perform, because these attacks are more powerful than the standard ones. Deciding when to actually use these attacks adds another level of strategy I appreciate, because you only have so much FP, and sometimes you might want to save your FP for harder enemies. Another thing the game introduces early on are badges. You get a badge not too long into the game. Badges are these equipable items that grant Mario special perks, whether that be make Mario's attacks more potent, at the cost of some FP, or making fighting overall just a bit easier. One of my favorite badges is the Zap Tap Badge, a badge that permanently electrifies Mario, making him dangerous for most enemies to attack, and even making him invincible against certain enemies like Fuzzies. There's the Partner Swap Badge, a badge that makes it so you don't have to use a turn to change partners. The Happy Heart Badge is another good one. It slowly refills your health throughout the battles. Probably the best one, and or at least potentially the best one, is the Power Bounce Badge. I say potentially because its usefulness is entirely dependent on how well you can time your action commands, because if you continuously time your A presses just right, Mario will never stop bouncing on an enemy, meaning you could potentially kill any enemy in the entire game, even bosses, with just one turn. I'm not very good with it, but that didn't stop me from trying to use it on every boss. How many badges you can equip depends on your BP, or badge points. The better badges tend to cost a lot more BP, while the weaker ones cost close to nothing. You can actually upgrade your BP and even HP and FP through leveling up. You level up in this game through experience, or star points as this game calls it. You get star points from battling enemies and bosses. How many star points you get depends on what level you're at and how strong the enemy is. Like a Goomba will only give you a few star points if you're at level 1, but if you're at, I don't know, level 20, you'll get nothing. It takes 100 star points to level up, and when you do, you get to choose what stat to level up first. Meaning, if you want to be a glass cannon, you can upgrade your FP and BP almost exclusively, or if you want to play it safe and keep everything even like me, upgrade your stats evenly. This provides for some variety in how you want to play the game, which is always nice. There's a lot of different enemies in this game. Some are entirely original like these club guys or zaps. But you'll mostly be seeing more traditional Mario enemies like Goombas, Koopas, Monty Moles, Fuzzies, Buzzy Beetles, Pokies, Piranha Plants, Bob-Bombs, Bullet Bills, and Shy Guys. 
There was plenty more recognizable enemies and even a lot of variations that come from the main series games too. Like Paragoombas and Bony Beetles, but it's mostly Paper Mario exclusive enemies like Spike Goombas, Putrid Piranhas, Dark Koopas, Pokey Mummies, and probably my favorite, Loombas. They're all harder versions of their original counterparts, usually with one or two major differences, like Spike Goombas are just Goombas, but you can't stop at them. Poison Pokies and Putrid Piranhas have a high chance of inflicting you with a poison status, which does one damage each turn until it runs out. Gloombas are really just Goombas that can hit a little harder, but I like them because they're kinda sort of from the main games. They're based off the blue Goombas from the underground levels of Mario 1, except there they were just Goombas in the dark so they look blue, but here, they're an entirely different species. It's a small thing, but I just kinda like how they interpreted a certain enemy in a completely different way from the main games. Oh man, Dark Koopas are probably the most annoying enemy in the game because they can continuously make Mario dizzy over and over, meaning you can't move so you have to rely solely on your partner, which is a problem depending on what partner you have. I'm surprised I went this long without talking about the partners. There's many different characters you come across in this game that eventually decide to join Mario on his journey. They all have their own reasons for doing so, like Goombario is just a massive fan of Mario so he wants to help save Peach. Cooper wants to become a world-famous explorer like his neighbor and hero, Colorado. Paracary is just a mailman who lost all of his letters, so he already wants to explore the world to find them, so might as well save the princess on the way, right? I really like how all these are iconic Mario enemies, like Sushi is a Cheap Cheap, Lacka Lester is a Lakitu. I really love how they made Watt into a little Sparky from Super Mario World. You know that one enemy that appears once in the whole game and until this point hasn't appeared in any other game? I really love that game, so to see them bring back such a little known enemy from that game is so good to me. They all can fight in battle, and they're all very different from each other. Some are pretty dang useful, especially why. A lot of the enemies in this game have this thing called defense, meaning they'll take less damage from you when you attack them. But Watt completely ignores that stat, and I love that so much! She even has this one special attack that stuns everyone on screen, and that is so useful. She's probably the best partner of the game, especially after you upgrade her. Bombette is a character I really should have used more throughout the game because I only realized how great her special abilities were sometime in Chapter 7. She can blow up everyone on screen while doing some pretty decent amount of damage. The FP cost is high, but it's one of the better special attacks, so it's worth it. Goombario being one of the less useful party members is the first party member you get, so he is the most basic. He can really only bonk on enemies and tattle. Tattling enemies allows you to permanently see the enemy's HP from then on. Along with getting a nice little description of that gives you some ideas on how to fight the enemy and what it's like. I used this a lot in the first three quarters of the game because it was just nice knowing I'll be able to see the enemy's HP from now on. Making the strategies a bit easier to come up with, though later enemies made me feel less comfortable with the idea of wasting a turn. Suchi was another one I really didn't find particularly useful. I left her for the chapter 5 boss because she's insanely useful for that boss to a point where she kind of breaks the fight. I mean, if you just do a splash attack every few turns, the Lava Piranha legitimately can't do anything. I actually feel kind of bad. Other than that, I didn't find her useful in any other situation. There's some partners I'm willing to believe are good in specific situations like Lackluster or Bo. Heck, maybe even Sushi or Goombario, I don't know. I just didn't experiment enough because I felt content with Watt pretty much in every situation. In retrospect, I probably should have given every other party member more of a chance for the sake of the video, but I didn't think about that until I started typing this script out, so whatever. Either way, there is definitely some kind of imbalance, so it would have been nice if they made the weaker partners useful in more situations. That's not to say that partners like Sushi are a complete waste because they all have their uses outside of battle too. Cooper can hit switches from a distance, Paracarry can carry across large gaps, Bow makes you invisible, which is great for stealth, Watt can light up rooms and find invisible blocks, Sushi can allow Mario to ride on her as she swims through the water, and Lackluster can carry you across dangerous hazards. Gumbario is the only one that doesn't really have a use, because the only thing you can do is give you details about the current location you're in, which isn't that useful. I use it so infrequently that I can't even promise you that I'll be able to find footage myself using it, because I didn't really use it much to begin with and I've been really slacking on taking notes in the last few videos. Like every RPG ever, there's also items. The items I care most about would be the recovery items, items that replenish your HP or FP. I mostly care about the HP ones, you know, the thing that determines whether or not you die, but it's also good to have a few FP recovery items. There are items that replenish both, probably one of the better ones would be the Wacka Bumps. You get them after hammering the one Wacka in the game. 
but be careful because you eliminate to only 10 of them in the whole game before he calls you out on your abusive behavior and leaves for good. Considering you get Wacka bumps after smashing the heads of Wackas, does that mean they're just balls of flesh filled with pus? That disgusting thought aside, they recover 25 HP and FP, which is, throughout the good chunk of the game is all of your health. Even by the end of the game, it was like half my HP, so it really doesn't matter how disgusting they may be, you're not the one eating them. Mario is. There's also defensive items and offensive items. I really didn't mess with them too much either because I had a partner that can already do similar attacks or because I had star abilities that can do the same thing. And I'd rather use my very limited item space of only 10 item slots for recovery stuff. Oh yeah, star power is a thing. After you free a star spirit, you get a new ability. They're basically rechargeable items. Some recover HP or FP, some immobilize the enemies, and some hurt all enemies on screen. I ended up using the Star Storm ability a lot by the end of the game, especially when I was close to a level because level ups refill your star energy. You can also refill your star energy very slowly just by fighting, it happens automatically over time. Or if you need some more energy now, and you aren't close to a level up, you can always just use focus at the sacrifice of Mario's turn. I overall really like this battle system. It's simple, despite the fact I just spent the last 10 or so paragraphs talking about it. But it's not too simple, so even if you're a veteran to the genre, you shouldn't be bored playing this. There's still a lot of strategy. You can't just attack enemies however and whenever you want. There's usually an optimal or a very bad way of beating certain enemies. Or maybe even multiple different ways to do so. And it's a lot of fun figuring out what those ways are. Nothing's ever too complicated, so it's never too daunting figuring something out. I suck at these kind of games, and even I thought of some pretty good strategies, and I somehow didn't die at all in this playthrough, so I think this is an excellent starting point for turn-based RPGs. I know plenty of people will say the same about the other Mario RPGs, but I don't know, I, I don't think that's entirely true. I mean, it is, just not to the same extent as Paper Mario. The other games have big numbers, and those scare me. I don't think the special attacks are explained very well in Superstar Saga in particular, and they're not as straightforward either, so... It kind of makes for a more daunting experience, at least for me. I don't know about anyone else. To be clear, I am not calling Mario and Luigi bad. Just as someone as stupid with these kind of games as me, I think it's important to strike a balance between depth and simplicity. And I think Paper Mario does a better job at that. It's all I'm saying, don't get mad at me. That's one of, if not the most subjective things I have said in this channel, so... Yeah. The partners with all of their special abilities, the badges, the items, and all add nice layer of strategy. And like I keep on saying, it's pretty simple to understand, and again, I really appreciate that. I also like the action commands a lot, because it introduces another element of skill. Having to press the right button at the right time makes combat a lot more engaging to me, because without it, I just get a lot more bored, because personally, I think that's way more uninteresting. I don't enjoy just picking a list of possible attacks, so I really like that Paper Mario has that kind of thing going for it. Of course, there's way more to an RPG than just the battle system. There's a whole world to explore. The overall gameplay will have you do things like solving puzzles, which are never too hard to figure out, which I guess can be seen as a positive or a negative depending on who you are. I personally don't really care because I get way more out of just exploring. There's a lot to do through exploring, like finding star chips which you can use to buy badges, or even just outright finding badges. There's blocks you can use to upgrade your partners, secret bosses that are usually guarding some badge, or maybe they're just there for funsies. You'll find a lot of the optional stuff in Toe Town Tunnels, a much less gross description of what that area actually is. You even find the last jump ability down there, so yeah, it's very much worth looking down there whenever you get some kind of new ability. If you do, you'll find some optional bosses down there, all of them being bloopers. I don't really think any of them are particularly hard to be honest. The only other optional boss I did was Kent C. Koopa, and he's actually not hard if you know what you're doing. If you don't, oh my god, good luck. His defense and attacks are disgustingly high, and finding a way around that is pretty tricky, especially when your solution requires your partner, and he repeatedly knocks out your partner every time they wake up. I didn't die to this guy, but I came incredibly close, I only survived because I have bloodlust for Wacka. He's not even the hardest optional boss, I'd be anti-guy, and I... I had a no death run going, I didn't want to stop that, so... Yeah, no. This being a Mario game, there was even a decent amount of platforming. It's nothing compared to the main games, of course, probably because Mario's jump is so limited in this game, but I appreciate being here nonetheless. 
But aside from solving puzzles and general progression, there's a lot of looking around figuring out what to do next just by talking to NPCs. The NPCs in this game are pretty cool. You got normal toads, but you also have toads that wear entirely different outfits. Sometimes their outfits depend entirely on where they live. Like the ones in Dry Dry Outpost here. It further drives at home the point that these aren't just copy and pasted toads. So I appreciate how different a lot of these toads are. It's not even just toads, a ton of Mario creatures have speaking roles in this game. Even Mario enemies. I kind of already mentioned that Mario enemies can be good guys in this game back when I was talking about the partners, but I'm talking about it again, so shut up. The mainline Mario games only ever have bad Goombas, bad Koopas, bad Babams, you get the idea. Just like the Toads, they have clothes to distinguish them from the bad ones, with the exception of the Koopas. The good Koopas in Koopa Village looks like normal Koopas, but the bad ones... Oh my god, I actually love them. They decided to give them Bowser-like bracelets and sunglasses, and I actually really love this look for them. I kinda wish this is just how Koopas look like and everything from now on. They don't even limit themselves to well-known Mario enemies, like Mazers are a species in this game, and Camels. I don't think they're actually from anything, but I like them. Anyway, there's a lot of dialogue in this game. Some of it is world-building, others give you two hints, some are just funny. Mario RPGs are known for their sense of humor, and Paper Mario is no exception. The first couple sequels are definitely funnier, but this game still has a lot of great moments. There's a character, Junior Troopa, a bully from around Goomba Village. He's an early boss and Mario beats him up pretty easily. He continues to fight Mario several times throughout the game, not because Bowser ordered him. No, no, he's just that petty and refuses to accept Mario is stronger than him. The extreme lengths he goes through is pretty entertaining, like, after the chapter you go to an island just as you leave, you see he swam across the entire ocean just to get to Mario. When he finally arrives, he looks off in horror as he realizes that Mario just left and he's gonna have to swim through the ocean again. There's also a part in Chapter 7 where you fight him in the snow, and when you beat him, he just lays there, and if you leave and come back, he's completely frozen. He stays there the entire chapter! I really don't want to spoil too much, but there are a lot of great moments in this game, and it's so cool to see a Mario game this charming. I kind of want to talk about the graphics for a minute because, wow, I think this might actually be the prettiest N64 game out there. Games with stylistic art styles tend to age the best. It's why many people love Wind Waker's graphics so much, and I think Paper Mario is one of those games. It goes for this Papa Book look. Everyone's made out of paper, and the levels themselves are like dioramas, and I mean, look at how you enter buildings in this game. Instead of relying on full 3D models, Paper Mario instead uses 2D sprites. Or, uh, textures? I'm actually not sure. Either way, they're not 3D models, so this game aged better than most games of this era. Obviously the actual environments are fully 3D, but it still doesn't look nearly as polygonal as any other game at the time. I'd assume it's because they're able to squeeze a lot more out of the hardware, thanks to the lack of character models and the restrictive camera. Either way, I really love how this game looks, and a big part of that are the redesigns. Paper Mario with his different art style prompted intelligent systems to give everyone soft redesigns, and I really love what they did with Paper Mario. Everyone looks more cartoony compared to how they look in the main games, and I've always been a big fan of with how they did Mario in these games. The dot eyes, the round body, and the lack of legs combined with how he walks. I just really love how he looks in this game. I know the original design for him in this game is a bit different than the design I'm talking about, but I think his in-game sprite looks closer to his Thousand Year Door design than the box art, so whatever. The only character that looks decently different from their later appearances would be Peach. There's a lot more subtle differences, but I mostly just notice a hair color. It's a lot darker than her later games, other than that, everyone else looks the same as their later appearances. The music in this game is... fine. I don't know, it's just that none of it really stuck out with me. There's a few songs I thought were catchy while playing this game, like the title screen theme, Toe Town, or Goomba Path. It's all fine, it makes for fine background noise, but this soundtrack isn't really something I go out of my way to listen to, unlike some of the later games. Just like how the 2D games tend to have 8 worlds, Paper Mario has 8 chapters. Each chapter have their own stories to tell and people to help. The first one is pretty standard, it's a aggressive feel that ends with a castle. It's a Mario game, so... I guess it makes sense to start off with something recognizable. The second is a canyon, followed by a desert, then an ancient tomb. Chapter 3 is when the game really picks up. It's this area with a haunted mansion full of boos who want Mario's help. There has been this invincible monster named Tubba Blubba terrorizing all the boos of the mansion, especially the nearby village, by eating them. I somehow don't think boos would be the most feeling thing ever, but whatever. The key to defeating this invincible creature is to find his heart and attack it, which is remotely controlling him. So he may be invincible, but his heart isn't. 
That sounds like a cheesy tagline to some romantic comedy. Anyway, the game really picks up from here. Chapters 1 and 2 really aren't that interesting, you know, grass and then desert. But then from then on, it gets pretty interesting. There's a penguin murder mystery where a woman lies and says she saw Mario do it. Stupid lying penguin bit. A toy box that's filled with shy guys that you explore by shrinking down. There's even a level heavily based on Yoshi's Island, complete with Shy Guys, Ravens, and Yoshi's Island music. Oh, and, uh, Bag Yoshi. There's actually a lot of Yoshi's Island references in this game. I approve. Despite all of this, I still feel a lot of these levels are, I don't know, kind of standard. With the exception of the Toy Box and, to a lesser extent, Tubba Blubba, these are all levels that would feel right at home in a new Super Mario Bros. game. Don't get me wrong, I still feel what you do in these levels is what makes them feel unique, but it's undeniable that more interesting theming would've been better. In the whole game, there's only one chapter I outright dislike, Chapter 6, Flower Fields. I like the theme, that's not what I call a standard Mario theme, but there's a lot of back and forth. This whole chapter is a giant fetch quest. Get the thing to get the other thing to get the other thing and so on. I don't think this chapter is awful, in fact I think I might only dislike it as much as I do because the rest of the game is so good. And this one is actually kind of weak. At least the fight is kind of good. Huff and Puff, he's one of the harder bosses. Every time you hit him an enemy spawns and they could actually attack you and Huff and Puff can even absorb them to regain his HP. So you have to use some attacks that hurts every enemy on screen. My only problem is my thumb gets really tired after all the button mashing. Thanks to stuff like this, every boss in this game feels so unique from one another, and it feels so good to exploit each of their weaknesses. Aside from the main characters, there's also the Peach sections. In between each chapter, there are sections where you play as Peach, where she does things like sneak past guards, solve puzzles, bake cake, participate in a game show, and later on even disguise herself as Koopa Trolls or Clubbas. These start out really simple, like the first one is just opening up the secret passage in the fireplace and reading Bowser's diary, but they slowly introduce more and more challenge. She does all of these things to catch up on Bowser's plans and find out where Mario needs to go to next. Twink, a star child that recently moved on to Star Haven, acts as her message boy. He goes to and from Peach's castle to Mushroom Kingdom to deliver messages to Mario and sometimes even items. I actually really like these, it's pretty cool to see what Peach is up to, that's not normally ever the case. It also means Peach is actually useful in this game, which is incredibly rare. These are also just fun little sections that add a lot to the story, and it's fun to see Bowser's excitement for his unstoppable minions, along with his inevitable disappointment when they fail. And then there's Chapter 8. After getting all seven Star Spears, Mario goes to Star Haven so he can actually meet all seven Star Spears and earn the new ability Star Beam. Star Beam is the ability that requires all seven Star Spears to perform, and it's so strong it takes away any invincibility Bowser had by draining the Star Rod's power. Mario then flies off to Bowser's Castle. Bowser's Castle is the hardest part in the game. Go figure. It's full of the toughest enemies and the hardest puzzles. I say hardest, but only one tripped me up a bit, and there's still some pretty cool stuff here. Turning the lava into solid rock, raising and lowering the water level, and there's even these quizzes. The last of these quizzes isn't really a quiz, but a challenge to rematch the Koopa Bros, but then Junior Troopa shows up out of nowhere and knocks out the Koopa Bros. When you defeat Junior Troopa for the final time, the quiz guy doesn't know whether or not to let Mario pass because he doesn't know if that counts. I love this game. There's very few toad houses in Bowser's Castle, in fact the ones that are there are actually jail cells with toads, and you actually have to work for them by killing the nearby guard to collect the key. For that alone, this stage is a lot more deadly and it shows how far Bowser has gone. You see all these toads locked up and talk to them and a lot of them really wish they didn't go to Peach's party to begin with. Once you get past all of Bowser's guards and make it to Peach's castle, you see the window Mario fell through in the beginning of the game and finally meet up with Peach and then fight Bowser. The first fight isn't bad, he does a lot of damage but assuming you have a lot of recovery items like you should, he shouldn't be a problem, just block when you can and use your strongest abilities, and star beam him whenever Bowser uses star rod and he'll go down quickly. The second phase is mostly the same, except Bowser powers himself even more to a point where the star beam doesn't even do anything, and he somehow has the ability to disable one of your three main options being items, jumping, or hammering. Meanwhile, Peach and Twink are fighting Bowser's minion, Kami. Twink tries to attack Kami, but it does nothing. All Peach can do is focus, which gives Twink more and more power, which makes his attacks hurt more and more, and he takes less and less damage, and Kami eventually gets knocked out. Peach doing this gives Twink the idea of having Peach wish for the Star Spears to become more powerful, changing Star Beam to Peach Beam. 
which has just enough power to nullify any power the Star Rod initially had. From then on, the third and final phase is pretty similar to the first, except a bit tougher, thanks to Bowser still being stronger. Not too long after acquiring Peach Beam, Bowser loses and the castle begins to blow up, and of course Mario recovers a Star Rod. Fortunately, the Star Spirits are able to protect Mario, Peach, Twink, and Peach's castle, while allowing Bowser, Cammy, and Bowser's castle to just fall to the earth in a fiery explosion. Hey, weren't there toads locked up in Bowser's castle? They never got out. Oh well. After everything is said and done, Peach invites Mario and all the other heroes to the castle for a party. Oh, and uh, Luigi. It's pretty cool to talk to all these characters after the kingdom is saved. After talking to Peach, you get the final cutscene where Peach thanks everyone and the greatest credit scene commences. You get a parade with every character in the game, and I love all of these character interactions. They're pretty great. So that was Paper Mario, an actually really good game. I don't like RPGs, but I still like Paper Mario, and I think that says a lot about how easy it is to get into. It's a relatively easy game. Heck, I, like I said earlier, I didn't die at all in this game, and I suck at this genre. So if you want to get into the genre, if you want to get into RPGs, this is an amazing starting point. Or if you just like Mario and don't really care about getting into the genre as a whole. Still worth a shot. The problem with this game is that it's not the most accessible game out there. In fact, this goes for every N64 game because the easiest way of playing N64 games legally was the Wii, the Wii Virtual Console. But unfortunately, Nintendo recently pulled a plug in that, so uh, yeah, and that's how I played Paper Mario, so either you need to track down an original copy or uh, get on the Wii U Virtual Console, which uh, as much as I like that thing, no one has that, so, yeah, I really wish Nintendo was better with re-releasing their old stuff. But if you do have the ability to play the original game, please, it's it's a really good time. So, uh, Paper Mario does have sequels, some being amazing and some being sick or star, and I do plan on covering these games at some point. I'm just not ready to marathon an RPG series. Also, I can't record 3DS games yet. Uh... So, I'm not going to continue the series for a while, but I will at some point. As for the next video, um, I actually kind of want to do something different. The next video I'm doing isn't a review, but it's not, you know, far off from what I already do. So, uh, I guess I'll see you then.